Good morning. Um, I mean, the privilege is all mine, really. It's a great honour to be here representing Health Habitat and talking about uh, one of, I think, our great Australian architects, I, who I did have the great fortune to work for for the last eight years of his life, but continue the work of Health Habitat, and which is what I'm here to talk to you today about, and hopefully inspire and make you almost as angry as I still am 15 years later about some of the issues that we are charged up about. But first, a story. Um, my old man grew up in this little house in the southern end of the Peloponnese in Greece um, in the 50s by what you define by definition is poverty. Uh, the house was shelter and that, you know, to them it was fine. Where they lived was the yard. And my father, out of, partly out of survival and partly out of entertainment, liked to pull things apart, reassemble them in creative ways. And, for example, some of the things he used to do, creative, you know, eating protein in the village was, was a very poor place, bartering was a system, money didn't really exist. Um, and you can see in this photo taking pride of place in the back of the two sort of animal carcasses cooked, that was very rare. Uh, and my dad often said he was hungry, so he created little uh, bird traps to catch sort of ground birds that would skip along the, along the grasses to cook them himself as snacks. Uh, another thing he used to do would, um, water to the town was sort of fed from a mountain spring and you can see the mountains in the back of that, classic to the Peloponnese. Uh, so if you lived downhill of the houses, which in which case they did, if someone uphill turned on the tap to fill their trough, you'd be waiting a while. So he'd worked out if he painted a 44-gallon drum black, mount, filled it, mounted, mounted it onto a bit of a, a, rock, a, a rock pile, attached a, a, a can to a hose that fitted into this uh, gallon drum and punched a few holes in it, he had a shower. And he didn't know he was making a shower because no one else had one, but there was a kind of logic to it that he was really, he used his hands to understand. I have verified some of these, you know, across the course of his life, I verified some of these stories and apparently they're true. Um, but Dad, Dad's curiosity was as helpful as it was destructive and that when, especially when he started experimenting with gunpowder. So he, um, he started small, sprinkling a little bit of gunpowder between two rocks, standing and clicking your heels, and the bottom one explodes and makes a big noise. All of this stuff, like those and a few other experiments, led him to one very great feat that's well known in the village still. My grandfather, his father, was the village priest. Now, in villages like this, the village priest is mayor, governor, you know, lord of the town. And the church is a really important meeting place. So when the church bell rang, once, it meant there was a town meeting, twice, a wedding, three times, a funeral. So hopefully you know where this is going. So my dad wanted to know what would happen if I put a bomb in the church bell and let it go. How would people react? So, you know, it's not one, two, three. <laughs> um, so, of course, the resounding gong left everyone confused. They all descended onto the church and my father's sitting in a tree having a great time. This existence fundamentally shaped his world, and therefore mine. Uh, he used to say to us growing up, all you need in life is common sense. There is a logic behind everything you do, and if you understand that logic, then you understand how it works, and only then can you change it. Well, of course, I, oh, excuse me. I love this thinking, and when it came to, um, when it came to deciding the kind of experience and life I wanted to lead, architecture seemed to be the right fit. Uh, things like, you know, understanding something to its core, the unnecessary and the frills really become peripheral and inessential. That's not to say they're unimportant, but when it, you know, architecture felt like the right fit. Um, so about three years in, I, uh, into architecture school, I got caught up in the wow factor of I'm really not working this very well today. Um, of hypothetical design problems and where that were really fun for the first few years, but when it came to sort of ex leaving the, the academic bubble and entering reality, um, I started to panic because I thought, what am I actually contributing? 
And I remember distinctly a, a turning point where we just spent a semester studying this wonderful, important building in the sort of advancement of where of our places in the world as architects. And at the end of the semester, I asked the lecturer, so we know what this does. It's, um, it's credited for its open plan design, ergonomics. We know Le Corbusier's importance in the machine of living. And that's been very profound. But how, uh, how long did the clients live there? To which they said three months. Now, this was fine and totally deserving of its place, but I felt that that bit of information about how, who was living there and how long they were living there and whether it was, might have had something to do with the success of the building. Um, and I suppose I panicked even further because our studies seemed to proliferate this notion of the architect as sculptor of space and master artist that doesn't necessarily need to worry about the people in it. And there's a place for all of it, but there was no way I could go back to my parents and say to them after working their butts off to get me into a tertiary education, of which I'm the first of both sides of my family to go to university, and I'm certainly the first woman to finish high school, uh, that I got a degree in architecture to create buildings to look at. You know, I could see the lecture about common sense descending on me from my father, and so, so I panicked and sought other avenues. I realised that you know, we're, we're given this profound education where, in the pursuit of architecture, we can find really complex, sorry, simple solutions and incredibly complex problems. Construction is our medium, and people are our subjects. And yet, as I discovered within a few years of our education, and of course later ongoing in practice, that I think, I think that's changing a little bit, but still for the most part, our skills are shoehorned into what I believe is a very narrow offering of what we do. Um, one that perhaps values above all else the poetic, the innovative, the beautiful and the photogenic, but overlooks the real, the, inner, the essential, the poor, and the unfair. So it was about at this time I met Paul Fleuros. Excuse me, a great man. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Paul had flipped on its head the very tradition, the, the notion of what a traditional architect was. He had a small practice. Uh, at any one time in its history, it had two people employed, a two-year waiting list of clients, and a commitment to building small, beautiful buildings for people that connected them to science. Site, then people, then building raised principles. And the traditional architecture he did was very deliberately hidden from view. I think not because he was embarrassed by it, but uh, because if he was going to talk about something publicly in his role as an architect, it would, it would be about this idea that had a very big issues to fix with a very simple solution. And that idea is housing for health. Housing for Health is a methodology born of the challenge by this man, uh, the late and great Yummy Lester, in the mid 80s, uh, who, despite being blinded by the atomic bomb testing in the late 50s, early 60s, had the vision to understand that what they were seeing in the, that was coming into the clinic uh, from within his community could, needed a bigger strategy than symptomatic treatment. Uh, he pulled together an architect. There's Paul, this is, again, you can tell it's the mid-80s based on the fashion and facial hair fashion. But there's a, they pulled together an architect, Paul, uh, a doctor, Dr. Paul Torzillo is still around, and Steffi Raynow, the community health worker, standing behind Miami there. Um, he pulled these three blokes together and said, you know, with no real offer of notoriety or great budget, he said, we need you of your particular skill sets to help us stop, stop people getting sick. And by the way, these are all the people you have to answer to. Um, now, for context, at the time, families were moving into government-built housing from humpies like this, and there was clearly, and there was no 
there was no improvement on health. And Dr. Zilzilla actually has the stats based on the local health council on, on this information. So it's not, it's not hearsay, it's fact. So, you know, just because we build, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It certainly doesn't mean it's better for us. So Tozillo went away and uh, devoured all relevant national and international literature on public health. And after six months, this is a famous story that they will tell, came back with a list of prioritised health goals, and these are it. These became the healthy living practices, and they're a set of key functions that list out, sorry, they're a list of key functions that the environment needs to facilitate in order of priority to reduce and eradicate common preventable diseases. We don't always have the money to fix everything, so these priorities ensure the biggest impact on health can be made with the money spent. So things like from immediate trauma, things like will the building kill you from gas asphyxiation to electrocution to structural, you know, structural safety, um, through to regular infections of the eyes and the skin and the lungs. But we know that repeated infections of children in those first five years of those sorts of things, common bugs that are often third world bugs, um, greatly reduce the lung capacity, the vision and the hearing of children by the time they hit school age. And common skin infections lead to needing renal failure and needing dialysis by the time you're in your 40s. I mean, we can't talk about closing the gap if the, ha if the houses around them are literally hurting them. Uh, so the first HLP, for example, is um, the ability to wash a child every day. So each health goal puts at the centre of the person and then connects them to the bits of the physical environment needed to in ensure that that person gets the ability, for example, to wash every day. So we asked, does it have reliable water supply, a way to heat the water and get it into the tap, uh, two taps that work, a tub, bath or sink for children to be able to wash in, a plug, a safe place for dry clothes and wet stuff on the other side. Very basic stuff, all of it missing, usually, or not working. It was Paul's idea to actually get into the houses and test them. So as the architect, you know, he was presented with this list of goals in, in terms of health gain and it was up to him then to work out how to change the physical environment. And he, he sort of used to say, I was totally green, and I thought, well, we just have to educate people in how to turn on a tap, you know, or they just need showers, you know, they need to know how to walk into a shower and turn it on. And, of course, that's, you know, it was Dr. Torzillo that sort of said, well, how about you go in and see if they're working or not? And sure enough, a lot of these houses didn't have functioning showers, don't have functioning toilets. Some of them are built upside down and back to front, and they're, they're all government built. So I think this is actually the genius of the idea. It's, it seems very simple but, and very obvious now, but at the time, testing houses to ensure they were healthy was quite a radical idea. This is now 30 years in the making. So on day one, a team on every project, locally trained teams walk through the houses surveying and testing over 250 items. Eat, by lunchtime, surveys are entered into a database which spits out a job list. Um, and there's a woman in the middle, she's a local uh, da data manager trained up. She's entering all of the sheets. The data s then spits out job sheets for a local, or usually an introduced um, licensed plumber or tr or electrician, and by the afternoon they're fixing those items in the same house. Never go in to a community without making immediate improvements. Reports come after the work, not before. Okay. So this, the surveys ask some very rudimentary questions, like is there hot water in and out of the tap? Do you know, is, is hot and cold working? Because a lot of the time these things are, you know, are hidden into walls or pipes that aren't necessarily working. So. It's not, are they pretty, what type of model it is, is it, which, which brand did it come from, it's just, are they functioning? Um, I mean, you can see, and I'll show you some examples along the way of some of the things that, you know, that the teams actually face when they're walking in. Uh, so, in terms of an update to date, uh, that work started in a small, community somewhere around here 
uh, in about 30 years ago. Since then, 241 projects, 9,361 houses have been surveyed, affecting almost 60,000 people. And this is what the team's still walking into. So only 9% of those houses are electrically safe, 38% have a working shower, and only 60% have a working toilet. Um, so when the trades go through and they do those fixes, they don't get paid until they identify why, what the cause of the damage or issues are for what they're fixing. And repeatedly, this hasn't changed in the time I've been working on this work for 15 years, it's long, and I'm still a freshman to the work. This spread has never changed. So the majority of items fail due to lack of routine maintenance. Things break down when they get used a lot. 19%, and this has actually come down, and is uh, just things that are built upside down and back to front. I mean, that's a laundry, and that's the tap right up in, underneath a PowerPoint. And aside from the fact that this is a laundry and that's just absolutely negligent, you can't get a plug it's so close, you can't even get a plug to the underside of that other, other GPO. So to connect the laundry tub, they're using a, an adapter that barely fits and is da dangerously close to a water source. I mean, this isn't even, this was built. It's appalling. I can assure you that that plumber and electrician both got paid and are never be to be seen again. Now, I don't know which bit's worse, but that to me still pisses me off, you know. And this isn't the worst of it. We've got hundreds of examples like this. Sometimes, you know, one of my favourites is where uh, a sink was installed into a brand new house in the Northern Territory. and So the sink was installed into a vanity, the plumbing was installed into the floor, and nothing connected the two. So. The families, of course, the wastewater is not going anywhere safely, so they have to put a bucket underneath. And what we tell people, which is often untrue, is that seven, you know we find that 77 percent. It used to be nine. Now it's seven percent of the reason those things fail is because of lack, of because of damage of any type, misuse, abuse, or damage. And often they're classified as damage because the, f the householders are trying to fix the problem themselves. So what we actually tell people is that Aboriginal people are the problem. It's too big a problem to fix, and Housing for Health is too small a program to do anything remarkable with, so it's not worth funding. That, that's the exact opposite of what we actually know, reality, data, you know, 30 years of work. Not only are people not the problem, they are part of the solution. To date, still 77% of all teams are locally trained people employed to do the work. They wear yellow caps so that they're identified. They've been doing it for decades and communities are aware of who they are and what, what they're contributing. This work wouldn't happen without them. So, so with the survey fix, what you get in one, one survey, these are the sort of results. Uh, we're able to get 83% of houses electrically safe, 88% with a working shower, 92 finally have a, sh a flushing toilet. They should be, we should be starting at 100% and not having to do this work, but here we are. Now I know architects, we love graphs, but sit with me for a moment. This, saying the same stuff, um, if we just look at this bit here, this is just safety. So will the house, you know, is water and waste actually connected to the house? Is it electrically safe? Is the gas connected? Will you not, you know, uh, die of asphyxiation? Um, is it safe structurally and fire? And these are the percentages that we walk into. Now, we are builders, we are architects, we're responsible for our built environment for all people. This just, uh, I don't know why this is still existing, you know. And then we get into washing a child every day, laundry services, getting the bugs, washing them out of our systems and out of our, off our bodies, off our sheets, so that regular, normal, very preventable infections can disappear from our environments. 
we're not always able to get 100% because we don't always have the money to do that, but we get pretty close with some very rudimentary things. So the health impact, this is one example of many, but more recently, the New South Wales Department of Health did a, a survey, a million, millions of dollars it cost to produce a survey of 10 years of housing for health in the state. They, and they found for two, so 2,000, 2,000, 2,230 houses, at about $11,000 a house, we were able to get a 40% reduction in hospital admissions for any illnesses attributed to the environment. 40% reduction. That's, you know, even Tozillo likes to, being a medico, who likes to pull apart data and doesn't trust it, which is his job. But even he still says, even if it was 10%, that's still more than any other programs have been able to deliver. So people are not the problem. He's never found that. This work may have started in Australia, but the impacts of our environment on health are not geographically exclusive. And they're definitely not linked to Aboriginality. That's where the work started, because poverty exists there. Bugs don't discriminate. And, but what is consistent is the link between places of poverty and the environments that do people harm. So some of this work has gone overseas. And I'll talk about uh, just a couple of those projects. I think I'm going OK for time. Yeah. Uh, so Nepal, we are this again a small community, um, a village on the edge of the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, HH was invited in to provide help a solution. The community always has to invite us in, just like Yami yes, Lester did. Um, for them, you know, hills in Nepal are mountains to us. So most people live on this sort of slope, and in the village there was no sort of nobody has toilets or functioning you know, sanitation of any kind. Most of them don't have electricity. You know, these are subsistence existences. And so I suppose the, the UN sort of term it as open defecation was the way, you know, people used the bathroom. And, the, and of course, with that sort of ground cover, if you were downhill, people were getting sort of more and more gut infections. On top of that, um, on top of that, Green timbers were being cut down to sort of fuel fires for cooking because, again, there's no gas or any of that sort of electricity. So, and landslides, I don't know if anyone's been to Nepal, but if you just travel through parts of, you don't have to go far before you start seeing a landslide. These things kill people and the trees are what hold that together. So, um, there are poor castes, the Tamang people, and so we started small. At this stage, we built one toilet. This was designed specifically with them in mind, with them. Paul did the designs. Um, and, you know, it's got the same approach to detail and, and attention to health hardware as any other project would. I mean, I could give you, I could spend 45 minutes on just that sketch and tell you exactly all the things that it's doing. So uh, we tested uh, uh, the, the stage one for the project was a one septic tank system and one biocast system attached to this toilet design. The toilet had to be lockable. It had to let it had an Asian pan in it. It had to be easily washed. Uh, a tap on the inside and on the outside for hand washing and for uh, dip flushing. We added a, a rainwater tank to the back because again water supply was an opportunity. And that little thing up there is a solar light for nighttime because there are tigers in the area, uh, and so on. Um, the area around it was also something we ended up working on to discourage mud walking in, but you get the idea. So we tested a, a septic and a biogas system on stage one, mostly because uh, biogas had sort of came with these um, uh, perceptions of sort of poo smelling gas. So we had to sh test that with the community to make them aware that it didn't do that. And of course it didn't. And out of, if you have one buffalo and a couple of people living in the house, you can produce four hours of cooking, free smokeless cooking fuel out of some poo in a chamber under the ground. Since then, this, this work started in 2007. And since then that work, uh, we've built 
137 toilets, and most of those are septic. About 60% are septic, and the rest are buffalo, using buffalo waste, because you, you need the land and you need a buffalo. Uh, so I've just, I mean, you know, technically, this is sort of the overall idea that you have this health issue, there's an environmental solution that's very simple, and then the health result is, you know, in Nepal we don't have data, we don't have public health data to work from, but you just, it's, you're still human and you still understand that these things make sense. You can see women walking up the hill and they're not gasping for air anymore because they're not sitting in a smoky room for four hours of the day cooking for everyone. Um, those little things have a great impact. Both systems, the, both the, the, uh, the septic and the biogas systems produce a really nutrient-rich fertiliser, which in every case the ground is restored over the chambers underground and yields are trebled, have almost always. Paul always understated that, but it happened in my visits that almost everyone who had these systems had more crops and more money coming in their families. Um, Local teams build them. Uh, they, you know, they're incredible. They're, all of these people live there. Most of them are residents of their own house, and part of the arrangement was to make sure that they were helping build. If they couldn't give some money in kind, they had to help build, and that was just no problem. Um, you know, our job is not to stay there and do the work. It's actually to support the talent locally and build and maintain those toilets. Um, so we've also partnered with a local, uh, I suppose, INGO who uh, bring trades to our projects and ma mainly plumbers because we also, you know, plumbers are health workers. Um, so they come to our projects and these are some fantastic blokes working with all of our local teams on different, different uh, th this is, you know, putting together a first flush diverter to the rainwater tanks. Um, learning how to uh, shrink connections using fire because they don't have any other sort of, mech you know, they don't have a lot of technology in Nepal. All those things, they transfer and learn from each other and that's really been incredible and, you know, an important byproduct of this work. Students have also been involved for the last sort of four or five years. We've run sanitation studios in Nepal um, and the students are forced into a position where they have to work with local people, ask them tough questions, uh, learn from the stuff that's happened before them, come up with a solution and make sure that they leave something behind that's worthy. You know, not, and, and I should say that a lot of the students aren't necessarily getting credits for this course. You know, some, some years we were able to achieve that but for the most part they were off their own bat. Um, and, and multidisciplinary teams. Most of them architects, but we've involved medicine, law, etc. And they, you know, these are some of the things they produce. They've uh, maintenance checklists for the toilets, the tools like siting and sizing for uh, school toilet blocks. We've done five so far, and they have, you know, based on the population, they have worked at how many toilets they need, how big the septic tank chamber has to be, and then they design the toilet based on real stuff and that that was from the year before and then the students kind of continue working on those things. This is an example of using that and it actually being built for a school um, on the edge of the valley for 400 students who none of none of whom have toilets at home. Um, siding kits, this is brilliant to show to help families site a biogas chamber underground it was a big problem for some of the families because they didn't understand that it was underground and that their land would be restored. So the students came up with this siding system where that's the, that's the footprint of the toilet, that's the rainwater tank and that's where the biogas chamber and working with the families to site them on their own site. And of course, I have to mention the earthquakes when after 2014 earthquakes, we went back to the original village, Batidara. Um, you know, Paul and his wife Sandra have been very committed to this particular village and they went back, did some em in initial emergency work and then, and found that almost all the toilets 
remains upright. That's a great photo of seeing sort of one of the toilets with the house crumbling around them, that none of them needed repair. Um, however, you know, safety was a big issue. So working with an, an Australian engineer to come up with a banding system to rebuild their own houses that are earthquake safe. And of course, since then, all the houses have been rebuilt, plus another 19 in a few villages nearby. Um, now to South, South Africa, a really tough, very dense place. Uh, again, totally different place, but again, we were invited in by a community. We started small, um, and for this, this, uh, this is an extraordinary place. Deep Sloot is in the edge of South Africa, and it sort of receives hundreds of thousands of migrants from all over Africa into Joburg, and this is the sort of gateway into finding work. Um, this is, to, it's, it's kind of hard to comprehend the scale of the place. Uh, so, following the end of apartheid, uh, the local, the Joburg Water finally put in some infrastructure, and this is what they call plumbing. Uh, so they, they put in these uh, toilets. Nobody has toilets in their own little um, homes. So these are precast concrete toilets that are stacked in, put into the ground, and they were sort of all came after the settlement. And of course, they're all leaking, and it's you know that's that's just seeping into the ground, and there's, that should be a street, and most of them are open sewers. Um, so a local a local resident group circled at the top corner there. They they sort of coordinated themselves take a little bit of money from all of the residents nearby to took it upon themselves to maintain those toilets and invite and therefore needed a little bit more help because of the scale of the problem for them that was sort of beyond their skill set. So HH was one of a few people that were invited in to help. What you can see and just um, on some very rough estimates and I'll show you some examples in the next slide that Based on the population, there's about 130 people use one of those toilets per day. So if you think about that, and also they don't get used at night because of safety, so um, that's a lot of people. And yet the fittings that were put in are very domestic. You know, these are stuff that you'd use to put in any house where you might be three or four people using it every day. Um, you know, they just they copper flogging. So what we know is that gut health is a massive issue. It's a, um, I think one in five children under the age of five die from diarrhea in South Africa. So, you know, it's a problem. So we, uh, hey, Paul and HH started with, uh, again, another um, international plumbing group and the local team, WhatsApp. Uh, we started small, so I just, you know, this is deep, this is extension one in deep suit, that's, you know, the, the black line. And this is the section we started in first, and just in that area alone is 390 houses, or homes. Uh, so 3.3 people, that's about almost 400 people living in this area alone. So the green bits, uh, the green little dots are uh, clusters of toilets. They were the first toilets, you know, we started again small, this was 10. Next to that, on site C, we blogged those to see what the comparison was once, we, once a few upgrades were made. And the short of it is, um, in a day, just by fix, updating, changing a system, changing, fixing leaks, some very simple things with some very skilled plumbers, um, we were able to save 4,000 litres a day per toilet. This is my favourite image of all. Um, that indicates a one cubic, you know, a thousand litres in, in volume. And WASAP invited Joburg Water into, the, into this site, built a cubic, you know, a, lit, a thousand litres of water and said, we're saving four of these per toilet per day just by doing these very simple fixes. They didn't cost much and it's costing Joburg Water a fortune losing all of that money. So they're trying to really use it to advocate for more maintenance. Okay, again, local teams are involved. We get more plumbers in place. And 
the work, you know, within a couple of weeks, they, they drastically improved. Um, but again, you know, we don't sit on that. So we wanted to see if there was a better design solution for these toilets and ha held an international, with IATMO, the same plumbing mob, held an international uh, challenge where teams from, all, four different teams from different countries, India, South Africa, Australia and USA descended on deep suit. We plucked out broken toilets from the, from the town, put them into a yard, replaced them with fixed ones and made these teams work on the, the broken ones to come up with, to see if there was a better way to do things that we hadn't seen yet. We logged them over a six month period to see which ones were working, performing best and then out of that picked out, you know, the better solutions. Most of them were variations and a very similar thing, but you know, we, maintenance is a massive issue on that sort of scale of use. So how do we work it out? How do we make sure it keeps getting better? Um, and similar stuff to Australia. So we, you know, the, the, we offer up a survey process where the teams know they, per toilet, they log every single toilet, they maintain them, they have maintenance checklists and know exactly how to set out things, where to put the upgrades, it's all laid out. Um, and now, they're un, uh, now they've got this sort of maintenance program where we help them develop a maintenance checklist that sits on an iPhone app to a database that all of us can see. And they, they can log in anywhere on the site within DeepSuit and we also get access to that data. Um, and this is the teams, they are the ones doing all that work. I should say that at the moment, WhatsApp is trying to advocate for this work to continue and it costs, we worked out it costs 200 Australian a year to maintain one toilet. It just doesn't, it's not much money, but it's, it has a profound impact. Um, and of course, we've done many projects around the world, but a lot of them have led then to this project where we're finally, not finally, but I think the great vision for Paul to move overseas with this work was eventually to get housing for health. I think, I think he used to say that, you know, Australians really only pay attention to work that you do in Australia when you're really successful overseas. And I, you know, and I think that's kind of true. Um, nonetheless, now, in the last couple of years, we've started a housing for health in the Navajo Nation of the USA in New Mexico. It's the biggest nation dedicated, biggest land holding dedicated to uh, their First Nations people. And um, the houses are in similar quality uh, the, to what we see in Aboriginal Australia. So we've done two projects, both 10 houses each, and the, and again, the results are remarkable. Some of them don't even have water connected to them. They have the infrastructure there, they have the house, and all that requires is some paperwork to get the house connected to water. But a lot of these homes have been living without running water in their houses for generations. And within a week, a couple of weeks, and some very skilled people, that's all undone. So, I think that, you know, this might not be architecture, but I think it is the role of an architect. Um, I feel like, you know, this work is so incredibly essential and for the most part it's overlooked for because maybe, you know, it seems obvious for, work, for taps to work, for kids to be able to wash the, in their buildings, but I think we're a bit complacent um, in that because most of us don't, aren't affronted with that, I think, on a daily basis. I certainly, I mean, you know, this isn't a radical idea and it's certainly not a new concept, public health. But Housing for Health seems to have found, cut through and found a really simple solution to something that's extraordinarily, extraordinarily complex. Um, and for me, it's always been, you know, it's, it's always been that, that thing that sort of rounds out what we offer as architects. We, it's, you, it's profound in its simplicity. And I feel like, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have conversations with some of my wealthier clients about a kitchen top over the idea that maybe, you know, 
let's talk about how you use it. You know, is it going to copper flogging? What are you going to do about it? You know, if it if it fails, and and maybe do you need to wash your child in the sink? Rather than filter through or entertain, you know, a Pinterest board full of peach terrazzo samples that I have to try to work through and entertain in terms of that sense. So I feel like, you know, that's important, but I feel like we've got more to offer. And this work has certainly made that, you know, fleshed out, I think, what we could offer as architects. I certainly want to see, in my lifetime, our industry publicly state that architects are unified in believing that housing has an impact on health. I certainly want to see that. Um, you know, I think that while it's important to embrace some of those beautiful and the irreverent and the radical and the most groundbreaking stuff, all those shiny beautiful things are nonetheless implicated if we ignore the poor, the broken, the failing and the injustice of our environments. Um, housing for Health for me, it's just, it's not just an idea for tackling poverty. It's not, it's not a simple, it's not just a simple and effective way for fixing environments to make sure they're healthy to live in. It's not just a toolkit uh, for any one of us to use in our daily practices. For me, I think with enough people behind it, I believe can be the bomb that we let off inside the Church of Architecture that, you know, redefines our purpose and ultimately ensures that we remain relevant to more corners of society. And, you know, if all it does is confuse a whole bunch of people, at least it was fun to watch. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank <laughs> you.